This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Get ready for the greatest roast of all time, the Roast of Tom Brady, a Netflix live event happening May 5th Hosted by Kevin Hart, the seven-time world champion gets his cleats held to the fire by famous friends and frenemies on an unforgettable night where everything is fair game. Tune in on May 5th at 5 p.m. Pacific time for The Roast of Tom Brady, live only on Netflix. The Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast with your hosts, Kyle Borgannoni and Matthew Betts. Welcome in. We're back. It's Friday, May 3rd on the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Borgannoni, and I am joined, as always, by Matthew, Ho-ho, one of the boys of the summer bets. It's here, baby. Best ball summer is upon us. I am in a fantastic mood. I mean, it's a beautiful day outside. Underdog is dropping. Best ball mania. All of these other contests next week. DraftKings is opening their contest. It is a great day to be alive, Kyle. And, you know, people can't see this. So this is really good for audio podcast Mm, form. mm, But mm -hmm. I decided to rock my Merry Christmas from the Griswolds t-shirt today because, hey, I love that movie. It just feels like Christmas, man. It's like Christmas morning. It's it's here. The NFL draft is in the rear view mirror. Best ball summer is upon us. For those that want to know, I'm wearing a King Griffey Jr. shirt, but that's pretty much every other day at this point. I was going to say, it's either that or Mighty Ducks, and I feel like you probably are going to guess right most of the time. I was taking uh, Truman, my son, in this morning to the preschool, and someone stopped me and said, man, that, that uh, I forget how they said it, like, that Mariner's shirt, that's tough, man. I, I was like, all right, you know what? I've, I, some would say I have style. But I know my wife just says, you just pick out a different sports shirt almost every single day and you sit in front of a computer. It's not that impressive. That sounds about right. That sounds right to me. <laughs> we are going to kick off the summer of best ball in style. And you know what? L- let's just do this, Bets, because the people want what they want. They want access now. They want to talk about things now. And I don't know if it's any Mike and Jason just breathing down our necks. I mean... Talk about some mouth breathers, some people just right right behind us just saying, do this, do that. Um, We've got pressure from corporate just to get everything out as fast as possible, and you and I delivered. We tried. (laughs) I don't know if it's, you know, up to their their standards. I mean, their standards are so high, they're making us work around the clock these days to get this out. But man, NFL draft happened, and it's like, all right, that was cool to like kind of just think about it for a day, and then like Monday hit, and we were like, Let's go. Even Sunday, some of us were doing some work to get things ready in the Dynasty Pass, which is part of the UDK Plus. Been a, a lot of fun, actually, to dive through that stuff. But more importantly, to get these best ball rankings up on the site, because Jason, you know, he he gets excited. I mean, Jason's can you blame him? Jason's the worst at this. He's the worst. Can you blame him? We we talked about it, just for everyone to peek behind the curtain. We talked about it, like, behind the scenes. We were like, you know, the best ball contests are dropping sooner and sooner. We should probably get our rankings up as soon as we can. And Kyle, Kyle and I are like, yeah, that's a really good idea. We should do that. We go to record our Dynasty show, and Jason just says live on the show, we're going to have these ready very soon for you guys so that it's you know it's locked in, it's happening. It didn't actually tell us it was happening until we were on the show with him. So very fun to uh, to enjoy that excitement. But uh, man, they're live. I think when you're listening to this, you should hop in there and, and check them out. Yes. On our website, if you are a DFS Pass subscriber, which is part of the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus, so if you're like, I don't know if I have a DFS Pass... If you have the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus, you have the uh, big daddy, you have the granddaddy of them all, uh, for those that used to listen to Keith Jackson, Rose Bowl stuff. But you have the whole package, and in the DFS Pass is our live best ball rankings. You can sort by my rankings if you think I'm smart, or Betts' rankings if you think he's smarter, you can get a consensus, and also get up-to-date underdog ADP. 
So that's in there on the website. And I just want to tell people it will be coming to the app, but we were working to make sure with our team, with everything we have coming out this month, June 1st is the launch of the full Ultimate Draft Kit. We said, hey, we want to get best ball rankings in the hands of our people that are drafting with us and drafting right now. Because for the next, I don't know, three months, we're talking best ball every single episode. Uh, We'll do some win total stuff. You and I will talk more about divisional and awards. But like, we're in best ball mode and we want to make sure people are equipped. Yes, sir. Rankings should be up there. Um, This is the one time of year that I feel like my rankings are wild compared to ADP. And it's because a lot of this ADP that you're seeing when you start drafting this week, you know, it's, it's been from the big board from the little board that was happening in like February, March. Obviously now we have landing spots, we have draft capital. So this stuff is going to change wildly. So if you log in there and you see our ADPs versus our rankings and you're like, whoa, that is a massive difference. That is why as the summer goes on, we'll try to you know, bring them a little closer to market because we do want to use ADP as a guide. But right now, you will see some wild rankings for both of us. And I think it's a good time to draft when you can take advantage of some of those ADPs. Yep. So go to udkplus.com. And if you're one of those people that says, hey, I want to figure out how to do my own rankings, you can actually download them. You can do it at CSV. You can copy them straight into a Google Sheets. Uh, I have friends that that's what they do. They take those rankings, put in there, and then they add their own rankings too. So uh, it's on the website right now, fantasyfootballers.com, which kind of segues into our first question here. We're going to get into, we're not even going to talk mostly roster construction. We're kind of mostly talk about rankings. And at this point of the year, how do you get a little different? What do you do that the field's not doing? We'll talk about that, but I want to talk about the ADP of some of these rookies, especially the ones that are at the top. So um, I went all the way back to 2014, that awesome Odell Beckham, uh, Sammy Watkins, uh, Mike Evans, Brandon Cooks, Kelvin Benjamin class, you know, the boys. And over the last decade, we've had, I would say four, the number's 3.7 impact rookie wide receiver seasons for fantasy. And I'm calling that top 36 seasons. In best ball, top 36 is a big deal. In redraft, you might be like, eh, it's not that great. But in best ball, we really care about it. Last year, we had five rookies. But here's the the data and the point that I want to give and kind of start from is, We know that we have at least four to five of these every single year bets. Last year, the first rookie wide receiver drafted was, drumroll, JSN at wide receiver 36. Before I get any further, what can you tell me just about that data point alone and how we were drafting last year in best ball? I remember talking about it on the show. We brought it up. I think you looked up, you know, the historical trends and you were like, dude, JSN is literally going the highest a rookie wide receiver has ever gone in best ball. That didn't work. It didn't work very much last year. This year, we're going to have rookie wide receivers, I mean, being drafted as a group higher ever than, than before. Obviously, when you have Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze, who are three incredible prospects that got top 10 draft capital, that's understandable. But you're going to see, I think, a lot of other wide receivers in this rookie class get dragged up with them because as the years go by, you know, you do learn that like finding the rookies that hit is one of the cheat codes in best ball. And that's obviously easier said than done. Obviously, if you hit on Puka Nakua last year, you understand that. It's harder to do that when the field is getting on it more and more. But the data shows it is successful if you can do it. The issue is they're all going so high. So trying to figure out yes, you know, when you want to be in on someone at ADP versus when you maybe want to fade them at a certain ADP is kind of more of a nuanced conversation, I think, now than ever before. And when we talk about best ball specifically, we're talking about win rates, like players that exceed the advance rate, meaning your your teams actually make its way through if you're playing in a tournament and they actually like are, you know, they, they strengthen themselves. And a lot of times we talk about rookie wide receivers getting better as the season progressed. You saw that last year, like Jaden Reed down the stretch, uh, Rasheed Rice, Tank Dell had an awesome stretch, Jordan Addison. Those were the rookie wide receivers. So we see about 4.6 rookie wide receivers meet or exceed their win rate expectations. That's just looking at the ADP and what we'd expect. But the problem this year, you mentioned, is they're going higher than ever before. So Marvin Harrison, at wide receiver 9, 13th overall. That is by far the highest ever for a rookie wide receiver. Neighbors, at wide receiver 18, would have crushed what Amari Cooper or Jamar Chase did as rookies. You're not going back to the days when we could draft a rookie wide receiver like, let me give you some names, DJ Moore. Betts was drafted 145th overall in 2018. What a time to be alive. What a time. Some guy named Justin Jefferson. We didn't really know what to do with him, apparently. 
He was going 147th overall in 2020. That's so crazy to think about. It's <laughs> <laughs> so wild to think. So much also, has changed. So much has changed in the landscape. Also, a lot of the data is before underdog era, which is, you know, 2022, 2023, 24, like the last three or four years. So all of that to say, we if we're drafting right now in May and June, you can get some values on rookies, probably not the top three, but there are some guys that you might want to be bullish on. So give me a couple of rookie wide receiver names, and I'll give you some later names that I think will rise over the summer and I think are really good bets. Yeah, and just for everyone that wants more of this stuff, we're going to talk about a lot about guys that are going to rise throughout the summer on today's show, like some of our targets for early closing line value. I also have that up in an article form on the site. Maybe when you're listening to this, we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully by when you're listening to this, if not very shortly after. But the first name that comes to mind, and this guy is screaming up draft boards already, is Xavier Worthy. And the question that I have kind of to talk about with you, Kyle, is just like how high is too high? Because he started, of course, much later than where he is as of our recording today, which is 66.4 is his overall ADP, wide receiver 37. But it's hard not to get excited and want to follow it and at least get something now before he's a fifth or fourth round pick, which I, I think that's where he's headed. You know, you look at the situation, it's like obviously he lands with Chiefs and Mahomes. That checks the box. You look at Travis Kelsey, who, yes, he signed the extension, is another year older. They actually talked about like the plan is to decrease the snap rate in the regular season, ramp him up in the playoffs when it matters most. We saw that last year a little bit. So you kind of have that working in, in his favor. Rasheed Rice is certainly going to get suspended. Uh, we're still waiting on like how many games that could be, but there was just, uh, you know, not a report, but James Palmer, who's pretty close with the Chiefs, was on a podcast. I forget whose it was, but someone clipped the video of him talking about it. And in conversation, and I don't, he's not reporting this, but in conversation, he was like, oh, I think it could be, you know, I think it could be half the season. Like if we get six games for Rasheed Rice, four games, like no matter what happens, Rasheed Rice's ADP is going to fall. So Xavier Worthy is going to continue to rise. And then you have the Marquise Brown situation. And it's like, is Marquise Brown like still good? I don't, I don't know to answer that question. I mean, we talked about him a lot in DFS last year, like his efficiency numbers have dropped off 1.25 yards throughout run. 5.7 yards per target. He was 104th in ESPN's open score. Like analytically, he was just bad. So yeah, I get it that he's going to play with Mahomes, but I'm not sure he's the same player we thought he was three or four years ago. You have all those things working in the favor of Xavier Worthy. And then like, I think he's kind of like his profile as a, as a rookie. We talked about this in Dynasty. Like, I think it's pretty good. So like, I get yes. the rise. I just don't know where he closes. And it's like, man, do I want to be drafting Xavier Worthy in round four? When I could get him in round six or seven right now, you know, I'd rather take him right now. And a lot of the ADP, just to keep in mind, is from what people were drafting before we didn't know the landing spot. Right now, Marquise Hollywood Brown is going as wide receiver 36, and Xavier Worthy is going as wide receiver 37. They're back to back. That will change, right? Like, Worthy's going to surpass him. I think Brown is a terrifying pick at 62 overall, what I'm seeing right now. Uh, I just, so bigger question. The Chiefs are really good at morphing and figuring out over time, like, okay, this is what teams want us to do. Let's just figure out like how to beat zone instead of like going over the top over and over again. Last year, it was one touchdown of 20 plus air yards for Patrick Mahomes. And he said, I'm just going to beat you with zone. What encourages me about Worthy is at all four levels of the field, he won in college and that he has this production profile that doesn't just mean only screens, although they used him a lot this past year for that. So for a player this light and this fast, I usually go like, oh, I'm not going to like this player, but I, you should like Xavier Worthy alone based on what he did as a freshman. Like that that breakout age, this draft capital, he's a different type of player than what we'd usually say. Like he is better than Hollywood Brown at this stage in terms of what he's good at. So I, I'm down with that. You have another name here, Keon Coleman, who terrifies me production profile but if you think of Keon Coleman as a Gabe Davis or an upgrade over Gabe Davis then he's being drafted behind where we were taking Gabe Davis last year and certainly two years ago when Gabe Davis was what like a third fourth round pick so at 94th overall Keon Coleman can easily beat this ADP right yeah I think so and you know Keon Coleman's like a very polarizing player some people especially that love you know, to watch the film, think the separation issues are going to be a problem at the NFL level. Um, you know, his analytical profile is not good, truthfully. Like if you look at some of his stuff from a per route run basis, 
um, was getting outproduced by Johnny Wilson like at times last year at Florida State. So I see a path where this goes sideways pretty quickly. That said, I want to take a shot on Josh Allen's wide receiver one or potential wide receiver one now while it's still pretty affordable as like a borderline top 100 pick and maybe fade Keon Coleman in July or August when he's going in the sixth or seventh round, right? Like just just get him now. Get your shares now before it's too late, so to speak. Um, and then it's a different conversation and we'll see what happens come July, come August. But I think he's a guy who's definitely going to rise at least two rounds, you know, over the next couple months. Keon Coleman, Curtis Samuel, back to back. Another example in the rankings where it's like, ah, I don't really know what to do. I think this is one of those things you just bet on the big play. If anything, Curtis Samuel, who's been a fun player and you and I have always loved Curtis Samuel. Dirty Curtis. Dirty Curtis is, is seriously, he was a, my guy for me. Like I think it was like 2017 or whatever. 2018. I don't remember, but you're not going to get the insane best ball production I think you need. So Keon Coleman is a much better bet. I'm going to give you some deeper names, and I think you're on board with Roman Wilson, right? I am. Okay. Roman Wilson, drafted in the third round, Pittsburgh Steelers. He's going as wide receiver 72, 158th overall. So honestly, anytime you and I talk about players this late, it's like you can give the the bull case. You could say, here's where it goes right. And then if it goes wrong, you and I can go, oh, you know what? It doesn't really matter. You were drafted that late. So this is one of those picks where Kyle gets to basically say, if I, if it was right, I'm really smart. If not, don't worry about it. No, but for real, if he gets in on two wide receiver sets, I think he's a really easy win rate player. If he's on the field for those, I get the passing volume. It's going to be low, but he was second in this class in EPA per target. This past year at Michigan was a touchdown machine. It's really hard to to kind of go in the NFL and say that's going to happen. But I think wide receiver 72 is egregious for this player. I think if you draft wide receivers early and then you hit some zero running back targets, then you can come back around and get a rookie wide receiver as your wide receiver seven late and feel pretty good about his playing time and just how solid a player. Like this guy's going to be on the field a ton. Yeah, I think he will be. I think he's probably going to earn the wide receiver two job, if not week one, very quickly when you look at the depth chart. And it's don't gross. laugh when I read these names, Kyle. Okay, Deontay Johnson, obviously now in Carolina. Van Jefferson, I, he, Quez Watkins, Calvin Austin are the names he has to beat out to earn wide receiver two playing job You know, alongside George Pickens, which I think he's got to do. And, and when you watch his game and kind of think about him from like a – NFL coaches are going to love this guy's standpoint. Like he blocks actually pretty well in this offense. You have to do that to get on the field. Um, I think he's a guy that coaches are going to love, and I think he's going to get on the field early. And, you know, he wasn't uh, a high volume guy, obviously, at Michigan with the offense the way it was with Harbaugh, but like on a per target basis, he was very efficient. And it's a, it's a very similar setup, right? Like they're going to run the ball in Pittsburgh, but when it's there, he can win with efficiency. Um, so I, I like it. And I like that thing you threw in too, of like, if you hammer the stud wide receivers early, grab three or four out of the gate, maybe you get an elite tight end, elite quarterback, something like that. And then you just like fade that bucket of wide receivers. Yes. That's like, do I really want to be drafting? I don't know, Cortland Sutton and whoever else is like my wide receiver three. The answer is no, I do not. Um, so you you grab running backs there, you grab a tight end or something like that. Then you come back and grab like your wide receiver five, six in this range. Roman Wilson is a perfect fit on those kind of kind of teams. I'm going to give one more gross name, and I'm just going to call it New England rookie wide receiver. If it's Jalen Polk at wide receiver 70 or my boy, Javon Baker at wide receiver 81, I think they're just resetting this wide receiver room, which if you want to look up their depth chart, they have all of the boys. I mean, they have Juju, they got Pop Douglas, they gave Kendrick Bourne a bunch of money, your boy Jalen Rager, former Eagle great, uh, KJ Osborne, Kayshawn Boutte, the I mean, all of these dudes that are clearly just dudes and are running routes that don't really matter. There's so much about this offense that you could say it's going to stink. It's a rookie quarterback. I do think Alex Van Pelt can bring over some stuff from Cleveland, which he's talked about, and it can be successful in the play action passing game. We'll find out what that looks like. Um, both of these guys are basically the exact same size. There's a two round difference when they were drafted, but you get them so late in that same range, like I said, just guess, pick one. I'm not saying both, but if you're drafting and you know, you want to fill out your wide receiver room, one of these wide receivers, I think will hit. I just don't know which one. Yeah. And that's where you just take your shot, right? Like if you're drafting a bunch of teams this summer, 
just manage your exposures. I think I want to get over overweight the field on both these guys and just embrace the ambiguous situation and say, what if Drake May's awesome? You know, what if he's great and he does produce some wide receivers that are useful for fantasy? And what if these guys beat out this is gonna shock you guy? What if these guys beat out Juju Smith Schuster, you know, and KJ Osborne? Like, would anyone be shocked? Of course not. So yeah, I think they're both really good targets. Again, just rookies in rookie wide receivers specifically that have the ability to rise in ADP and outperform that ADP when you get them now is such a cheat code. So I love that call. Yeah. And it's really hard this time of the year to figure out exactly who's going to be who. Like Jaden Reed was taken 50th overall by the Packers, but we had so many questions about Jordan Love. You take that ambiguous nature of what is a team and in best ball, you can take advantage because you're just taking the best of the best. So uh, rookie wide receivers are a great bet to make. And these are the cheaper ones. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. You ready? Showtime. On May 3rd, summer starts with the fall guy. What are you doing later? Let's drink a spicy margarita. Make some bad decisions. Yes. Audiences are falling in love with the most entertaining film of the year. Fall guy. Fall guy. Fall guy. That's what the poster said. See Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt in the movie critics say exists to make you happy. Trying to make it out? Nope. Because I don't either. It's not what I'm into right now. What are you into? Talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Fall Guy. Only in theaters May 3rd. Read it PG-13. Hi, I'm Daniel, founder of Pretty Litter. Cats and cat owners deserve better than any old-fashioned litter. That's why I teamed up with scientists and veterinarians to create Pretty Litter. Its innovative crystal formula has superior odor control and weighs up to 80% less than clay litter. Pretty Litter even monitors health by changing colors to help detect early signs of potential illness. It's the world's smartest kitty litter. Go to prettylitter.com and use code SPOTIFY for 20% off your first order and a free cat toy. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. So what Betts and I have prepared for you is kind of given some early looks. Like when we were going through our best ball rankings and wanted to make sure those were live for you, we asked ourselves the question like, okay, what do people need to understand? A lot of times we talk about strategy first and the framework and Betts and I are going to spend as much time on that. We have a lot of great resources on the website and on June 1st, we will have the full best ball primer. We walk through every single team, but this is more us discussing how you can draft in May, how you can draft in June, July, August, because it is a bit different. So let's get into it. Best Ball Bonanza. All right, let's talk best ball here. And, you know, Bets and I, a lot of times when we talk about you have 18 spots, we always talk about the opportunity cost of every single pick. And I only say this as a, as you know, ahead of time, but nothing, and I mean nothing, drives me crazier when somebody messaged me and says, who should I pick? It's round 13. Who should I pick? Bets, why Why does that, like, I, I know I get cranky sometimes, but like that, that just drives me up a wall because every single pick has an opportunity cost. And I mean, you should be, you're going to be drafting a ton. So like, I don't know, like pick the dude, like, Make sure your roster construction is fine, but like, who should I pick after every single round? That's up to you. Don't please don't ask me after every single pick. Everyone, please message Do Kyle not. and ask that exact question. Um, I'm going to actually be asking Kyle that all summer when I'm on the clock every single time. Um, I mean, it's it's such a difficult conversation to answer or a question to answer rather because it depends on how many running backs you have, how many wide receivers do you have, is your roster construction framework in place to take best player available, or like. Are you in a position where you only have three running backs and you're in the 15th round and you're like, I need running back help? You know, like, I, that's what you got to do. So it's very uh, difficult to answer. It's a you know team by team situation, but I would say pick your targets in certain rounds if you're drafting, and you know those are the guys you want to be overweight on. Find the guys you want to be underweight on. Make your decisions that way. But yeah, it is a difficult question to answer when there's so many factors at play with each pick. Every pick is so nuanced to be able to say, okay, what have you done already? What's on the board? What do you, you know, who do you like in the, in the future? Have you already picked two quarterbacks? You know, uh, have you hammered wide receivers early? There's just so much nuance. And so a lot of times we talk about roster construction as the framework for best ball. And we have some articles on the website. We really don't want to talk too much about that. But the simple rule of thumb is you're going to take two to three quarterbacks. 
and two to three tight ends. And based on what you do at one of those positions, you'll probably do it the other. It can work if you take three and three, but uh, the 90% of the time, you're probably going to take two to three quarterbacks, two to three tight ends, and then you're going to hammer wide receivers. And you're seeing that with ADP. You need at least seven wide receivers. And then the field has kind of said zero RB is the right way to go. I think what I'm kind of asking this early in the process, because wide receivers are pushed up, is there a way to counteract that in a tournament? Are people too overconfident that they're going to hit late running backs? Does the ADP even allow us to do that? But overall, two to three quarterbacks, five plus running backs, seven plus wide receivers, and two to three tight ends is a framework to start with. And you need to map out based on what the ADP is saying. Can I get this tight end late? which is a strategy I usually like. But any quick thoughts about roster construction before we get into the meat? No, I think it is. I mean, if you're new to best ball, like this is kind of the first thing to understand. And if you've been listening to our show for a while or you played for a while, like you clearly know this. But I'm so shocked every time I'm in a draft where it just happens. Like someone walks away with four quarterbacks and you're like, don't, that doesn't help. Don't do that. That's not going to help you win, right? That your team is dead already. Um, just trying to understand that like when you draft a team, there's so many layers of like, you know, stacking, roster construction, uh, week 17 when the schedule comes out, how many, uh, you know, elite wide receivers do you have versus late targets? All those things are things to consider when you're on the clock. But if you don't have the roster construction in place, it's almost like trying to build a house without a foundation. Like if your roster construction is off, your team is not going to be successful. And, you know, I've seen just a lot of silly mistakes already in the, in the first few days. Okay, so I was in a draft last night, Kyle. Uh, of course, it was a beautiful evening here where I am. I'm on, I'm on the deck, Kyle. Feet are kicked up. I'm going to pull up my phone, hop on underdog. And this guy, he's just hammering elite quarterbacks. You know, he has like one wide receiver through the first, I think it was like five rounds, had three quarterbacks, already had a tight end. It was like, oh, buddy. And I was drafting after this guy who took CJ Stroud in round two. So I was just, I was eating it up. I was loving it. But if you make those mistakes, you are literally letting your money on fire. We have what four years now of underdog data to go off of that just shows that that's wrong so the first thing that you should do if you're new is just check yourself on that and make sure your construction is in place yeah you don't want to wreck yourself so definitely check that and the goal isn't to make fun of people or say that can't work because i i you know i'll never forget like, but it I, also can't work <laughs> i mean i mean it can't if you're drafting I know, four quarterbacks and four tight ends no th- that is egregious to the point of you're saying like this team is dead but if you're using your hard-earned money, if you want to tell your significant other, hey, by the way, I just burned a ton of money because I took CJ Stroud in the second round, uh, just just understand, there's a reason we talk about roster construction and when to take certain players and why they're going certain ways. It's very different than your redraft league. And Betts mentioned it. We will talk more about the importance of weeks 15, 16, 17. When the schedule is released, we'll have content out, which will happen next week, including my favorite, one of my favorite articles where I walk through every single game and talk about the schedule release and what's good and what's bad. Anyway, let's talk about the timing bets because right now it's May. It's time for, you know, people to have a ton of fun. It's gonna, it's gonna be May. It, it's, it's a good time to be in on drafting in May, but it's also very different than when we draft in August, right? Like this is not the same. Right now we're trying to we're trying to get rookies adjusted to ADP. We don't really know. We don't know the order. So, tell people the difference between drafting in May and then the summer and then once we get to August. Yeah, so if you're drafting all summer, which we advise doing, um there's a few reasons that you would draft now versus August and and not just wait. One of those reasons to me, like we talked about at the top of the show, is to get awesome closing line value on players who You know, you're going to get a much better price now than you will in a few months. One of our favorite targets last year, and in hindsight, this is going to sound so silly, was Alexander Madison before Dalvin Cook was cut. If you can predict some of these types of moves, whether it's rookies rising in ADP, um, Rasheed Rice, we know very likely is going to get suspended. That's going to have a ripple down effect. You know, certain players are up for potential post June one cut. Like if you can target those guys and get the players that are going to benefit early at a much better price you have the ability to potentially build what a lot of people call like a super team um that's one of my favorite times to draft right now is if you can have kind of a a leg up on some of the news type items that it's sort of a soft skill in best ball usually it works out now 
it didn't matter where you took Alexander Madison last year. If you got him around 9, 10, or around 5 by the time we got to August, it was a train wreck. But the concept applied, like right? The process of getting that guy is, is an example. Another one, you know, Brees Hall coming off the ACL. There was concerns last year. Is he going to be healthy for week one? They're probably going to bring someone back. Like Hard Knocks fans are chanting Dalvin Cook's name, right? Like you knew something was going to happen with that backfield at some point when we got to July. And if you wanted Brees Hall exposure, it would have been very smart to say, hey, I like Brees Hall in round three, round four, but I feel like I can probably get him in round five, six in just two or three weeks if I wait. So just trying to like feel, feel that stuff out and get better prices on players is the goal of drafting early versus late and vice versa. I will say though, if you draft now, the obvious concern is you will be at risk of getting dead spots on your roster. To me, now is not the time to call your shot on who you think this year's Kyron Williams is or the RB2 in an ambiguous situation. Like the Jets are a good example. If Brees Hall goes down this year, there's going to be someone that benefits. But right now, I have no idea if that's Braylon Allen or Isaiah Davis or is he a Kanda. Like we should wait to try to get that information later when we actually know the answer that it's going to be one of those guys. You know, for example, last year, everyone was drafting Zach Evans this time of year because the dynasty community was in on him as a prospect. We thought, uh, you know, if they don't like Cam Akers, maybe it is Zach Evans and it's probably not Kyron because he didn't do anything in year one. And then like July got here, we got actual reporting, actual news of like, hey, Kyron's getting rolling this offense. Kyron looks like he's doing really well in camp. And you started to see that flip. And if you if you took Kyron or, or those guys you know, later, you had a massive advantage on the field. If you took Zach, Zach Evans early, it was a swing and a miss. So right now, my two goals are avoid dead roster spots and try to get closing line value on players that you think are going to move. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about mostly today is closing line value. But keep in mind, you draft all summer. The winner of Best Ball Mania drafted in the dead of summer. I will say June is where I think people, myself included, are just so thirsty for football that you have the least amount of information to go off of in June. You're really just kind of speculating. They're just kind of like maybe in shorts by in, in July, but you're just like not, you don't have anything. And so I would say if there is a month, you're like into summer and you're thinking of drafting, keep drafting in June, but information wise, you won't get as much as you think you want. Then you start getting July and August and that's where you get the really live players. So like Betts mentioned, like there were reports that Kyron Williams was the dude. We just kind of ignored based on what we had before of a seventh round running back. Like, oh, this could work really, really well. But um, for tournaments, how do we apply some of our DFS mindset? Because I think that's something you touched on. We were talking about earlier. It's like we can use how we approach the field in DFS and think about it that way for best ball and best ball tournaments. Yeah, I think there's like two ways that come to mind for me. The first is when you're thinking about roster percentages, like the Sunday morning in week six, and you sit down to enter tournaments, you look at your exposures, you look at the roster percentage report and the DFS pass, and you're like, I don't want to play a you know, 27% rostered fill-in-the-blank player. I'm going to fade that guy this week. We can kind of use the same concept right? in, in best ball. This is essentially a one slate. Now it's an entire season, so it's very different, but it's one slate, one year, one attempt to get this right. And so you do want to have your guys you're overweight on, guys you're underweight on. Think about it if you're going to run a 150 set, you know, those kind of examples. And one of my favorite ways to play this is to take pretty hard stances early in the off season, And then you'll have kind of the answers to the test, so to speak, when you get to August and you realize, oh, this guy is emerging as a legit, you know, threat in a backfield or a legit wide receiver three in a good offense. And the field wasn't drafting that guy in may or june kyron's the perfect example you're going to get him at a much lower roster percentage in the overall tournament than you would otherwise so that's kind of my first um concept with that does that make sense to you kyle yeah it's just taking what you think the field's going to do and kind of leveraging that against them it's what we talk all the time in dfs it, you know threading the needle and finding this year's kyron williams like or puka guys like that doesn't happen you it might not even happen this year i remember a couple years ago it's like oh i need to find this year's hunter renfro or Cordell Patterson in like the last pick. It's like, there might not be anybody that exists at all in that, in that realm. So d don't feel bad about that. But yeah, I like this point of the year. I like drafting in May because I think there are some egregious mistakes by the field of what they're already assuming. And so a lot of these guys like last year, <laughs> Sam Howell, my boy, 
Uh, was you were in on him. That was, and, and it didn't feel like, oh, he's going to be awesome. It's just there's enough there for me to say that he could be an awesome win rate player, and he was going at like pick 200. And Sam Howell was all over the place, but for best ball, he was an awesome QB to, to go for in best ball. Yeah, no, for sure. The other thing too, just again, kind of this this time of year, you know, there is the human element of this, right? Like you're going to get new users on underdog. Like this is the time of year where people are like, oh, I'd love to draft some fantasy football teams. You get some more novice players they are going to draft right now too. So like, you know, every year that turns over, you get more and more people as best ball gets more popular. You'll get people making those four quarterback, four tight end type of mistakes, you know, at times when you draft. So I think it's a good time to draft, but you know, you and I advocate drafting all year long, different ADP buckets to kind of get guys in, you know, advantages, disadvantages, that kind of thing. All right, let's talk about some closing line, closing line uh, targets. Basically, players that we think, hey, they're probably going to rise. So if you want to draft them now, you totally can. Or, hey, by the way, we can see this shakeout where they're going to fall. So let's start off with some risers that you like. Yeah, I mean, just rookie wide receivers, period. We already talked about some of the more obvious ones. I'll also throw out uh, Lab McConkey. You know, the Quentin Johnson thing last year was a train wreck. Obviously, a chance to be Justin Herbert's wide receiver one all throughout Malachi Corley too on top of that you know I'm not sure he can win as an NFL true receiver just because everything was so manufactured manufactured touches in college but behind Garrett Wilson you know it's Mike Williams on the wrong side of his kind of career arc off a torn ACL and no one right so like there's a path there I think he's gonna rise quite a bit those are just two guys um one guy that I think is gonna rise just from a health perspective in regards to his teammate at running back is Jerome Ford currently going off the board at RB41. Uncle Jerome. Um, Uncle Jerome. He was your guy last year. You know, you were all about uh, Uncle Jerome as just a, a good zero RB target as like your RB3, RB4. And I get it again this year, right? And it's not because I think he was incredible last year. He was good, RB17 and half PPR. But it's the Nick Chubb health, right? I mean, that's the issue here is that I think Nick Chubb's going to continue to fall on ADP with his not one but two surgeries on that knee late in his career, you know, I think Jerome Ford's probably the Cleveland running back you're going to want, especially right now when you can get him in the 140s, where I could see him settling in as like a, you know, round 10, 11 ish type of pick when we get into July and August and get information on Nick Chubb, who truthfully could start the season on PUP. And if that's the case, Jerome Ford is going to skyrocket an ADP. Do you remember last year he was like a, you know, around 200? And then it was like this slow, steady thing where it was like, oh, I like Jerome Ford, you know, at 180. 170, 160, you're like, oh, I don't know about Jerome Ford when he gets to 140, 130. Like that's <laughs> that's what you're going to see with some of these players rise. Uh, we also have the Denver running back room where it's it, something's going to change there because it's last year for Javante. Samaje is under contract, but they could cut him. Uh, they have Audric Estime they took in the fifth round who's a bruiser who thinks he can juke. He's a weird player, dude. And then uh, Jaleel McLaughlin, who was a really fun player, uh, McLaughlin at RB 51 is interesting. If you want to just take a stab late as like an RB five, I think that he could rise just cause he has juice. And, uh, we saw some big plays last year. So I like him. Um, I also like Ray Davis where he goes. I don't like Ray Davis, the player, but it makes sense. I mean, Latavius Murray, who is 10 years older than him was still getting, you know, run last year. Not a joke. Like literally 34 years old is Latavius Murray. Um, yeah, I mean, I get it, right? Like this this offense clearly likes James Cook. They value him, but it's more like as the pass catcher. And the issue for James Cook has always been his role inside the 10-yard line, inside the five-yard line. For context last year, Josh Allen had 14 carries inside the five-yard line. Latavius Murray had 12 carries inside the five-yard line. James Cook had just five. So when they do get in close, they, they've pulled him out for Latavius or at times uh, Ty Johnson last year. So like, I think there's value in Ray Davis, assuming he does win the RB2 job of saying, look, he's either a contingent upside play if James Cook gets injured or you could get usable weeks even just if he is the goal line back for this offense. There's some other rookie running backs that I think people will be on. Kimani Vidal, who is chargers six round pick that's where he went i believe um i feel like people are saying he's going to be like this year's isaiah pacheco where you just get this steady steam and jk dobbins has a health issue and gus edwards is old they don't have anyone else there so i feel like he's the trendy guy except here's the worst problem about it though 
He's not Rashina Lee, Baltimore Ra- uh, Ravens <laughs> running back great. You mean the boys of summer? I will say that Rashina Lee is currently one of the most important people in my life. And if you don't know who he is, you can look him up. Fifth round pick. Uh, definitely one of my favorite Ravens. players. For the Ravens, yeah. you didn't even say. <laughs> For the Ravens. Um, I have him ranked like right around like 203. So I am like telling people like, hey, you can pick him with your last pick. But um, yeah, there's really late rookie running backs. I'm scared though of these guys. Like Rashina Lee could be nothing. Vidal could be nothing. Are these like potential dead spots in a roster so where I- it's like, like two months from now, we're not even talking about them? That is a concern. I think for me, that's more of a concern with Rashin Ali. How dare you? I know. I just had to let you know. Um, be, mostly because, obviously, it's Derrick Henry. This team values Justice Hill. Now, Justice Hill is coming off like career year in everything, and he's always been more of a special teams guy. So I could see him sliding back into that role, Keaton Mitchell recovering from an ACL, and him winning the job. But I think we'll get that information you know, in July when training camp gets here. So he's a guy that I'm not necessarily aggressively targeting now, but I could see him rise and I'll certainly be grabbing my shares later in the summer. If we get that information, Vital is a guy that's so interesting because normally fading day three running backs is just going to work out almost every time. And it's not like he's a day three running back out of Alabama. Like this is a running back out of Troy, but this guy was in Alabama. Okay. So you got me there. Uh, (laughs) This guy was uh, not a sixth in PFF uh, Russian grade last year among FBS backs. I think he sneaky might be good. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I didn't really watch a ton of him, but like some of his underlying metrics are pretty decent. Now he's a four year player. It's a small school. It's not all created equal, but he's 213 pounds. That's big enough. He ran four, four, six. That's fast enough at that size. And this team is going to run the ball on first, second, third, and fourth down, no matter what. Right. So like if Gus, Gus Edwards is at the age cliff, and J.K. Dobbins isn't healthy this year, which there's a good chance he's not. I do think there's a very strong chance that he is at least making the team A and B having a role as the year goes on, which is when you want him to really hit. Yeah, it's the perfect landing spot with Giro, yeah. Greg Roman, and the crew. At the thing is, he's at 189 right now. What's as high as you think he could go? Like I could see him go 140, 150. Oh, I think he'd be down. higher. Really? So in my article that I have on the site, I have him, I, I'm, I'm putting a projected closing ADP and this could be totally wrong if there's injuries or whatever, but like just as it stands now, I think I put him in as a projected round 12 guy if See, that's this continues. Wild. And that to me is terrifying, which is, which is why like if I'm going to take him, I'm going to take him now when he's going 189th overall off the board. Yeah, I'm fine with that right now. Um, switching to the fallers and just kind of staying in that, that same team vein, uh, the Ravens, I was talking to Rasheen Ali, but Keaton Mitchell seems like a player. I have no idea why he is being drafted at 190. Like, he was injured in week 14, really only played like five weeks. And then, yes, he put up some insane runs, but I just don't understand people taking him at RB60. I mean, this is a player that you're expecting production out of, and there's a chance that he doesn't even make the team. Yeah, undrafted as well, which obviously doesn't help his recovery chances. Um Sneaky too with this one, by the way, like we're going to get news as the summer comes out. But at the time of the injury, I was concerned about more than just an ACL. So this is a guy that not only could get off to a slow start just from an ACL late in the year period, but if it is a multi-ligament injury, you know, really he's going to have an uphill battle to win the RB2 job. Obviously, Derek Henry is there. We just talked about Ali and Justice Hill is making the team for sure because of what he does on special teams. So Keaton Mitchell, I will have zero of this year, no matter where he goes. These are the questions that I get all the time about undrafted free agents. Like, look, what about this guy? It's like, yes, but if you look over the course of history, so many of these guys that have a flash in the pan, you never see them again. Like, who was the guy for the Jets? Uh, Zonovan Knight. Oh, Bam Knight. Yeah, like, those are the kind of players that you're like, I remember him. And it's like, why is that guy, like, not contributing on a roster anymore? Because, like, they mean nothing to an NFL team. So, uh, Keaton Mitchell seems like somebody that's going to fall... Uh, Kyron Williams, I feel like started at like RB four. Now he's at RB seven. I could see him getting around RB 10 when it's all said and done. Yeah. He's right now still going at the back of round two. I think he's going to be around three pick pretty soon. So he's a guy that I'm happy to just wait on. I I want my Kyron exposure just in the event that last year was sticky and quorum can't overtake the job and Kyron's just that good. Um, and this is like a, it's a really difficult conversation because I think, in dynasty formats, like I'm terrified of Kyron. 
But like in redraft, like I kind of want to be in on Kyron just because if it hits, like he's so powerful, right? So he's going to fall because of the Blake Corum draft pick. So if you want your Kyron exposure, I would wait. I think you probably get him back of round three in the next, you know, month or so. Devon Achan is a terrifying player in redraft, really fun in dynasty, and even more fun in best ball. And yet you're having to pay RB6 price right now. They drafted Jalen Wright in the fourth round, 438 speed out of Tennessee. They have Raheem Mostert, who's going, I think it was like RB23. So it's like, I get the path for Achan. I cannot pay RB6 price at 20th overall, but I can see him dropping a little bit to the point where, let's say I hammer wide receiver with my first two picks and I get Achan and go basically zero RB the rest of the way. Like I could have a really fun team that gets these spike weeks with him. So I see him falling, but I'm still like, I'm still interested. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine like, again, think about this in DFS, like showing up to a DFS tournament and having zero Devon Achan in right. week 17, like he, he could bury you. Right. So I want my exposure. Again, I'm going to wait. I think you can get him in the back of the third, probably sooner than later. Actually, in the draft I did today, he went, I think, 28th overall. So he's already slipping more than the ADP reflects. A guy that, I mean, he could honestly become a round four pick by the time we get more information, like if Jalen Wright's showing out in camp, rookie camp, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I would wait on Devon Chan. All right, one more player I want to talk about that's probably going to fall is TJ Hawkinson. Titan 13, 122nd overall. Where are we at with his health and his recovery? And like, where's the point where you would feel good drafting him? Because it it feels like right now you're kind of saying TJ Hawkins is going to be the second half league winner for me. When is is that? Can that be the case? Like, what's his timeline? So Hawkinson's tough because his injury didn't happen till late in the year. And then like most guys that have the MCL injury on top of the ACL, they wait for about a month to actually do the surgery until everything is you know recovered a little bit and the swelling goes down you get range of motion back so he didn't have surgery until late january so we're talking about a player who's coming off of a january surgery that will have less than nine months to get out there at training camp so he's definitely gonna be limited in training camp the entire training camp season there's a chance he starts out on pup and then as we see with these pass catchers usually it takes weeks to kind of get back to being you know yourself so could he peak in november or december sure that's possible but that's a bet i'm gonna bet against with the other factors at play one of those things is not just the injury we also have a rookie quarterback i like jj mccarthy the jury's out right like rookie quarterbacks fail all the time they hit sometimes but they also fail so you have that aspect of it the other thing is i think you need to leave your mind open to the idea that jordan addison could take a year two leap i'm kind of lukewarm on addison like i saw a little bit last year that was good i don't think he's incredible but he's good so if he takes a year two leap that hurts Hawkinson. And oh, by the way, Justin Jefferson was injured for like, what, 12 weeks last year of the year, inflating Hawkinson's numbers. So I think a lot has to go right for Hawkinson to be the pick you need right now at this ADP. And if you want your exposure, just wait. I think he's going to fall to the 14th round, you know, 15th round, something like that. As the summer goes on and we get those health reports, Hawkinson's the guy that I haven't taken once in like the big board season. I plan on taking zero of him in May and June. Yeah, it's definitely a weird case study where you get to look at a player that we know can be a difference maker. And if you draft him as your tight end two or tight end three, you're happy. But tight end two, you're getting zeros potentially for a while. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely interesting like it, to draft a player that could finish any week as a tight end one and yet also like kill your roster. So let's take a quick break and we'll give our early rankings tease. Allstate wants to remind fans that mayhem is everywhere. Like when your fantasy league meets up at your house. Everything's great until the hot plate gets too hot for the tablecloth. Now your kitchen's up in smoke. And if you don't have the right home insurance coverage, the cost to fix this is anything but a fantasy. So switch to Allstate, save money, and get protected from mayhem like this. Not available in every state. Based on coverage selected, subject to terms, conditions, and availability. Savings vary. <sighs> Spring is a time of renewal, so why not refresh your home with a little help from Blinds.com? Blinds.com invented a better way to shop for custom window treatments. There's no pushy salespeople in your home or inflated showroom prices. Free samples, free shipping, and our 100% satisfaction guarantee can put the spring back into your step and into your home, too. 
Shop Blinds.com now and save up to 45%. Up to 45% off at Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. So Betts and I, we have our rankings live on the website, fantasyfootballers.com. If you want to go there and you get to see them, download them, color code them, whatever you want to do in a nice spreadsheet. Let's talk about a couple players that we are higher on than ADP. And I'm actually going to start because I think this is the one I'm most excited about. And I could be wrong. I could be Hit so me. wrong. Who it's is it? Antonio Gibson. What could oh, go boy. wrong? I might be on hey, an buddy, island here. I'm, I'm ready to lose money four years in a row on Antonio <laughs> Gibson. So tell me why. Okay, so Antonio Gibson is going 169th overall, which is egregious to me. Just egregious for, especially among a group of people that love going zero RB. It's crazy to me, a player that people have touted for years that just got a three-year contract, wink, wink, it's probably two years, but still got a multi-year deal in free agency is younger than Ramondre Stevenson, who's entering his fourth year in the league. And this is a new offense. We can't just look at the Patriots and say, oh, this is what they've done in the past. Bill O'Brien's gone. Josh McDaniels was before that. This is a new offense with Alex Van Pelt as the OC. The Cleveland system, which... By the way, they have made it very clear they are bringing the Cleveland system over. Like they've said it in every single press conference. Ramondre Stevenson uh, was talking the other day and basically said, we're going to do a ton of outside zone. We're basically doing exactly what Cleveland did, which was a multi-back system. And I love Gibson because you know that he has the pass catching profile. You know that this team is short on pass catching weapons as it is. And... The scheme actually fits him better. 39% of Antonio Gibson's runs the last three years have been outside zone runs. It's only been 13% for Ramondre Stevenson. So I think he fits this a little bit more. And I don't even need him to basically crush and be like this RB, you know, top 12 guy. Like if, if Antonio Gibson is a top 30 running back, I am super happy for where I get to draft him. So he's going 169th overall. I would gladly take him in the 140s. Like you can wait and get him around early and, and feel fine, but people aren't drafting him until almost 170. So he is one of the guys early on that I'm targeting for zero RB teams. And you can tell me why I'm wrong. I will not tell you why you're wrong. I will tell you that I am terrified, but I, I think that's it. reflected in the ADP, right? Like we've done this for, I, I wasn't joking, like four years in a row. It's like Antonio Gibson could be the R- zero RB pick. Um, I think the price is what you're, talking about here where it's like he goes in a range where it's like is he really that that much different of a bet than i don't know chuba hubbard right now or ty chandler right now like it's the same bet of just like this is the backup they could have their own usable weeks but they could also have a scenario where they get you know four or five weeks of the year where they get the run if the rb1 is injured so it's it's the exact same archetype bet so yeah as part of zero running back builds i totally get it um i will say i have major concerns on this new england offense as a whole yes just i mean the betting markets reflect it too like the win total isn't you know one of the lowest um it's clearly not an awesome spot to target for like full-on stacks i would say but if you need an rb4 rb5 as part of your rb builds i mean i totally get it yeah the pass catching stuff is what i love most is like how many other dudes in this range can you just say can get 40 plus catches like that's really in the realm of outcomes where it's like jk dobbins is going ahead of him no chance right. I'm taking him. Tyler Algier, yes, I get it, but you need Bijan to go down. Antonio Gibson has standalone value. Like he will have flex worthy weeks where, you know, Ty Chandler, okay, well, you basically need Aaron Jones to go down. Chuba Hubbard, we already mentioned, like he's trending in the wrong direction. Jalen Wright is the RB3 for Miami. You need somebody else to go down. There's just so many other dudes ahead of him that I don't like. I mean, Zeke could be complete dust. And Zeke is going almost 30 picks ahead of him like that's what that's are you crazy. doing with the with the dallas backfield by the way oh man i'm terrified uh i'm gonna zeke, talk about it in a minute zeke is 141 dowdle is going uh two picks after him i mean i feel like it's the chance for just to get it wrong <laughs> yeah so and that's uh, that's my that leads us to my next uh segment here kyle this is pro podcasting um i cheated and I said, the player I'm higher on than ADP, and you'll see this reflected in my ranks, is what if the answer is just none of these guys? Like, what if Rico Daddle isn't a difference maker for your team? 
and he doesn't break out in year six or whatever it is because that's when running backs never break out. And what if Zeke is just washed, which every underlying metric says that that is the case? What if the answer is just the Dallas passing attack with Dak, CD, Brandon Cooks, and Jake Ferguson? Because that's what I want to do. And th- that's the stack that I'm highest on right now where, you know, it's tough to be high on CD because he's going at the one, uh, 102. But Brandon Cooks, Jake Ferguson, I think are value picks right now with this offense. You look at what they did from week eight on after the bye week last year. They were number one in neutral pace. They ran fast. And Dak was averaging almost 37 attempts per game. Dallas was fifth in neutral situation pass rate. So again, just follow like the offseason moves. This team doesn't invest high in money in a running back. Uh, their defense, I think, potentially could be worse this year. They're not going to be bad. Of course, they're going to be good. But you lose Dan Quinn, your defensive coordinator. Trayvon Diggs is coming off a torn ACL. They had insane turnover luck, which made Dak's games kind of weird in the beginning of the year. Remember, they had those like massive blowouts. Like if that type of stuff doesn't happen, you know, their first round pick last year, Mozzie Smith was a train wreck. Like I think this defense could be worse than people think. And if that's the case, it's going to help elevate Dak's ceiling, the pass catcher ceiling. So, I mean, I just want to be high on Dallas's passing game here. And that includes obviously CD Dak, but also I think Brandon Cooks is a fine target this year because the current wide receiver three is Jalen Tolbert, who has done nothing in the NFL. So you could see just this passing tree be ultra condensed between the key weapons of CD, Brandon Cooks, and Jake Ferguson. Yeah, we thought that they were maybe on the table to take a wide receiver early. You know, like I think that when they were at pick 24, a lot of people had AD Mitchell or, you know, Brian Thomas or those kind of guys. But what's great about the Dallas stack is it's one of those weird backdoor stacks where CeeDee Lamb's going second overall, and then the next Dallas player is Dak at 81st, and then Ferguson at 91. Uh, Then you go to Cooks at 137. It's like, if you take Lamb early, which you should, by the way, then you're just kind of get to wait. Like, nobody else is going to jump on Dak unless you're drafting with the dude who's drafting four quarterbacks. It's like, you can secure this stack very easily and then add a third piece if it's Cooks or Ferguson, um, is yet it is really tough to figure out who the late person is. I could not tell you. I'm not telling anybody to put their money on somebody else. I think they sign a veteran. That's that's my my thought. Zay Jones. Somebody somebody's got to run around and do some cardio here because it's it's uh it's wide open. The depth chart's pretty bad. Um, can I can I talk about your Eagles? Oh, please, brother. Let's stay in division and talk about the Eagles, a team that's going to be reflected in my ranks that I'm going to be much higher on, especially the pass catching options. Okay. So the highlight is Jalen Hurts, Tush Push, Saquon Barkley. Those are the guys that you think, okay, the they're going to get a ton of the touchdowns. And the passing game, you know, Hurts has never gotten over what, 25 passing touchdowns. So it's kind of like, ah, do I really want to be in on the pass catchers and go for a full stack? But here's what's different this year. They have Kellen Moore as their offensive coordinator because they said Brian Johnson was not good at his job. He basically just copied and pasted, you know, what everyone else did. Shane Steichen, everybody else, they were just like, oh, this guy's just uh, Shane Steichen, Nick Sirianni, whoever else was was Steichen there. Yeah, he was he was there the year they, you know, really exploded and took off. Yeah, I feel like he's just kind of like lived on their coattails. But what I love about Kellen Moore is is that he's always heavily targeted the slot wide receiver. And when it was Dallas, before CeeDee Lamb, Cedric Wilson was second in the league in slot wide receiver touchdowns one year. Then it was CeeDee Lamb going bonkers. Last year, it was Keenan Allen. The crazy part about this team is I don't know who the slot wide receiver is. Last year, A.J. Brown was only 24% of his snaps. Devonta Smith was only 31%. And Goddard was hurt for a lot of the year. So... I'm curious to see how this team changes. They saw the highest rate, this is a football take bets, the highest rate of cover four in the league. So teams are running quarters against them. And although Hertz was accurate, he was not good against zone. 20th in YPA, which is very different than two years ago. So I think this team, which struggled with turnovers last year, was the third highest turnover rate in the year, that struggled against zone. I think that they're going to be able to figure it out if they get A.J. Brown more in the slot. So... A.J. Brown is going 10th overall. He's my 7th overall player. Devonta Smith is 34th overall. He's my 28th. And Dallas Goddard is at 112. I have him at 101. So all of those players, I'm ahead of ADP in hopes that this passing offense takes a little bit of a step forward. So I know you're super biased, incredibly biased. 
But on a best ball theory take, what do you think? I think this is the best take you've ever had. Obviously, zero oh. bias there. What an incredible call, Kyle. This team, I mean, how could you not be in? Um, I mean, I get it, man. Like, this is, I'm trying not to be a homer here too much, but I think we need to remember, like, how good this offense was in the first, what, 12 weeks of the year. And they were a train wreck down the stretch. I mean, obviously, they were one of the worst teams in football over the back half of the year. But when you look at what they did in the first, you know, two or three months, like, it was a team you wanted. And I think we're going to get back to that. The other thing that you didn't even mention when you were talking about this stack, I know that Jalen Hurts is a very tough player. People downplayed the knee issue. Like, I think he was hurt, you know, most of the year, at least the, the back half of the year after that Miami game. You saw the efficiency take a, a huge hit, the turnovers, just all that stuff. He just didn't look right. Get the healthy this offseason. Like, if it clicks and if it goes well, the Eagles, I think, are going to be a big part of best ball winning teams. And the other thing is, before we recorded, we were talking about this. Their prices are all depressed relative to last year, right? Like, yes. obviously, AJ Brown was always going in round one, but Devonta Smith was a round two pick. Jalen Hurts was a round three pick. Like, you had to spend your top three picks on those guys to get them on your roster. Yes, they're still going expensive, but Dallas Goddard is cheaper than he was. So uh, you can get, you know, two of these pieces and Jalen Hurts and it not uh, break the bank, so to speak. Yeah, the board sets up where you can go A.J. Brown at the end of the first round, get your second round pick, and then in the third, Smith and Hurts are sitting there. So you can kind of like, I mean, you had a team, right, where you double stacked and it's like totally possible yeah. to go there. Yeah, and you, not, you don't have to reach really at all. It sets up actually very nicely. Yeah, which also brings into account like other people will do this and it makes sure. sense. So, but just keep in mind that on the board. Give me another player that you are higher on than ADP. Okay. I'm going to talk about Jalen Waddle. Now, last year, when you think about Jalen Waddle's season, you think it wasn't good, right? You're like, he was hurt off and on. Like every play, it felt like he was like, please get up. If you have him in your lineup, you're like, please get up. Um, injured. Remember, he was injured in training camp. Like, I think that affected him a little bit to start the year with a hamstring injury. So, like, all of that stuff happened. But then Tyreek Hill was just absolutely insane. But two years ago, these guys were kind of neck and neck in terms of how they performed. We know Jalen Waddle is talented, obviously, right? And last year, he was going in the second round. This year, we're getting a little bit of a discount. You get him in round three. But the underlying metrics there are still very, very good for a player who was taken in the top 10 of the NFL draft a few years ago. 2.52 yards per out run last year. That was tied for eighth among all wide receivers with 50 targets. Also earning a target on 26% of his routes. Those are elite numbers. And you're getting a little bit of a discount on a player that you like, that's talented, and one of the best offenses in football. So I'm in on Jalen Waddle in round three. I have him up as more of a back-end round two pick. So I'm going to grab him a ton right now while his ADP is where it's at. The best part about Waddle is that his type of game is these monster spike weeks and it can work. Uh, I did a little bit of research early in the offseason of like, okay, when Tyreek hits, how does Waddle do? And there's also this added thing when Tyreek has been out, Waddle has crushed. So, you know, there's the baked in upside there too, but I don't know, wide receiver 20, I feel like he has a lot of room to climb if you know something happens to Tyreek, but even if if Tyreek plays the whole year, that's good for Waddle. Like that's good for him and this offense and and them trucking along. So I, I like the price this year. I'm I'm with you. Like I feel like he was at his ceiling last year, where you had to like basically say like, this this team is perfect. He never gets injured. But I think there's some wiggle room this year. Let's talk about some players that we are lower than ADP on. And this will be reflected in the rankings. I'm just gonna quickly say all of those running backs we talked about that are injured. I just wrote, nah, dog. Like, if it's Nick Chubb at 103, J.K. Dobbins at 173, Keaton Mitchell at 190, those are going to be much lower in my rankings. I'm just going to not only trust bets, but also you're trying to get it right that you are smarter than the field and like, oh, I'm going to get this major discount. And I would, I've found over the years, whenever I've done that, I actually have so many more dead spots in my roster than I believe. So I'd rather just have players that I know for sure are going to get snaps and like, I can't see J.K. Dobbins burying me at 173. There's so many other options. Like like I just mentioned, I'd rather draft Antonio Gibson, who's going at the exact same spot. For sure. And even if you disagree with this take, which that's totally cool if you do, just wait. Like, just don't take him now because their price is going to fall. So it's just one of those things. Just get the better price in two months, even if you, you know, don't have concerns like we do. But I'm with you on all those guys, obviously. Can we talk about C.J. Stroud? I, you know how much we both love CJ Stroud. CJ Stroud is so fun. 
The Texans are so fun. The offense is so fun. But this ADP is egregious for a true pocket passer. He's going 48th overall, a top 50 pick as a quarterback who's not going to run at all. And you need everything to go right. Now, could it happen? Of course, I see the path. Nico Collins took a huge step in year three last year. Tank Dell was great. Year two breakout. Let's replace Noah Brown with Stefan Diggs. I see the path where this works. But to me, the price just doesn't line up with the bet I want to make. And really what I think about it is like, what am I passing on to get CJ Stroud as the 48th overall player off the board? You're passing on guys like Trey McBride, Patrick Mahomes, um, Isaiah Pacheco, Mark Andrews, who I'm in love with again this year. What could go wrong? Like you're passing on really good running back, wide receiver, and tight ends in that range. But also like, can you can you match CJ Stroud's production, you know, more often than not with someone later in the draft? I think yes. When you look at these guys that are going after him, like I think Pat Mahomes is a much better bet with the moves that they made offensively at quarterback five. Joe Burrow, it's been a little bit since we've seen it, but quarterback seven off the board. Jamar Chase, you know, back obviously. T. Higgins is there. This is the offense we were all drafting with him as a quarterback five off the board last year. Let's grab him cheaper. Dak Prescott, I just talked about quarterback eight. I'm all over it. Jordan Love, would he would it shock anyone if he outperforms CJ Stroud this year? So that's my take is just I think the price is way too expensive. Every Texans player is going in the top 48 picks that you want. Just usually that does not work in best ball. I think one of those ADPs is wrong. I don't know which player it is yet. We'll have all summer to debate. But I think right now where CJ Stroud goes, that stack is just a premium and it's way too expensive for me. Yeah, I'm on the hunt for quarterbacks that have pass catchers that are elite that I can stack and I can say, okay, they can bring this quarterback to you know, QB 10 range, but I'm drafting them at QB 19 or whatever. Like there's, there's so many guys like that. And because you and I are just drafting two or three quarterbacks, depending on it, Stroud doesn't fit and he doesn't fit a player. Like if you go back and look at his game logs, you'll only remember like the really awesome games, like uh, against Tampa Bay, where it's just like, this was balls to the wall. Awesome. The entire time Stroud had like five games last year that were like super helpful. And in best ball, he was a winner because you took him super late. Nobody was drafting CJ Stroud or calling for that, but it's very, very different this year. So I'm with you, QB4. Like I have him in the QB7 range, and so I won't have him on a team. What's Yeah, and what's interesting about this is you don't even have to be out on Houston for this take to kind of like be right. Like you could still grab a couple of the Houston guys or grab one of the Houston wide receivers that you like, but then say, can I get CJ Stroud's points for cheaper, which is kind of my point. Like, can you get a cheaper stack elsewhere, but still get your Houston exposure? To me, that's what it's all about. Yep. I'm I'm all for that. I'm going to say that I am lower, sadly, on George Boy, Brock Bowers. 82 is an insane price to pay for me, for a rookie tight end. I know that Sam Laporta went bonkers and Dalton Kincaid quietly, quietly put up the fourth most rookie tight end receptions of all time, but no one's talking about it. I have Brock Bowers outside of my top 100. You can tell me if that is way too much, but 82 is a lot to pay because we're assuming a couple things. One, the Raiders are going to run a ton of 12 personnel. They didn't do it a lot last year. They also just didn't have the people for it, but Luke Getze, when he was with Chicago, that's their new offensive coordinator, he ran it on first down 23% of the time. That's like middle of the pack in the league, Okay. Raiders were 24th in that last year and they came out and they talked about Bowers being this hybrid tight end, you know, wide receiver slot guy, like kind of like what Dalton Kincaid was, right? Like this slot wide receiver. And at the end of the day, I feel like you're paying a really expensive price when Kincaid was going after this last year with a much better offense and a much better quarterback than Josh Allen. So to me, it's really expensive Dalton Kincaid on a team that does have another tight end, they came out and said, hey, Michael Mayer is still going to be playing for us. Now, they could be posturing, but what an insane move, by the way, to take a tight end 34th overall who has a great, like, the best production profile for a tight end is Brock Bowers. The second best is Michael Mayer, basically over the last decade. He's incredible. And so I don't know what this team's going to do, but I'm not paying that price at all. Yeah, and this this will fall for sure, I think, just based off the weird landing spot and you know, quarterback concerns of, is it Gardner Minshew or, or Aiden O'Connell? Like it's run first offense with Antonio Pierce, who literally not jokingly said like, we need to get Josh Jacobs last year, 100 yards every game to have a good chance to win. So like, they're going to run a ton with Samir White. Um, so that's, it's all working kind of against him, I think at this point, 
he would need to be an extreme outlier to actually pay this off. So I think I want like a couple shots at that in the case that he is that good, but I'll wait and I'll grab him at, you know, 120th overall when he eventually falls. So yeah, at, at 82nd overall, that is wild right now. I've got him at, as my, I think, 102nd overall player. So I'm with you well behind ADP. Yeah. And I'm rooting for him. Trust me. I'm rooting for Rock Powers because he's a fun player, but uh, I can't pay that in best ball. All right, bets. You've got one more. Well, did it work for those people? <laughs> no, it never does. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but <laughs> but it might work for us. <laughs> I love that quote. I'm going to make an official list of the it might work for us players in fantasy football this year because every season, every year, no matter what, we always find ourselves in a situation where a player has shown us who they are once, twice. <laughs> three times sometimes maybe four times and then we're like you know what but this year it might work for us <laughs> and so the player that i'm just not going to take him this is a guy I'll, I'll be fading you think about it dfs terms if you show up to a dfs tournament and you know rashad bateman is going to be 98 percent rostered in best ball mania which he probably will be i want zero percent of that player uh, how many times do we have to do it with rashad bateman right i know they had positive coach speak in the offseason i know they signed him doing a, l- a short-term extension here a couple more years but he was terrible last year. 86 out of 112 wide receivers in yards per route run. T- only 21 routes per game was losing time to Nelson Aguilar and, you know, Odell Beckham kind of on the, the wrong side of his career. This offense just, it really supports Zay Flowers, Mark Andrews, and now you bring in Derrick Henry. I'll let other people just keep drafting him as part of Raven stacks and just, just fade it. You know, this is a guy that he's shown us who he is at this point in his career. Uh, not a guy I'll be drafting this year. Yeah, Rashad Bateman, I want to root for him. I want it to work. And yet, I might not even be needing wide receivers in this range. Now, if you're playing in a tournament and you're hunting at the very end around pick 200 for the Puka of this year, it's not going to be Rashad Bateman. It's going to be somebody else that nobody else is on. So I don't think that you could, like, let me put it this way. What is the highest you could see Rashad Bateman finish at the end of the year? I think you could have a couple weeks where he gives you a spike week, he cracks your lineup, and he finishes as like the wide receiver 49. Okay, that's, I I put it like 38 as like very small percentage chance, but like top 50 is really asking a lot from this player, which is crazy. Like usually you can give any case. Darius Slayton, I could give a case for Darius Slayton who's going way after him to say he's going to be an every down player or Jalen Hyatt and these guys just ball out because... The touchdowns finally go their way, but I can't really for Rashad Bateman. And I hate saying that because you and I are both Ravens dudes. We love them, but they also brought in Tez Walker, who I think has a similar skill set. Like Tez Walker is a go ball guy. So I, I don't know. I just don't see Rashad Bateman, him earning enough targets to say that he's, you know, solidified. Can he get those deep touchdowns where he had like five in the first, like six weeks, a couple years ago? Sure. But I'm going to bet against that every single time in best ball. So yep. that's going to do it for this episode. If you want all of our rankings, you can go on the website. They're there. We will be talking best ball all summer. Make sure you hop on our discord because we're talking best ball all the time. In fact, you might even be able to draft with Bets and I, you know, we're talking, we're, we're inviting people. We're telling people to get in there. So do it. Bets. Tell everyone bye. We're back, baby. This just feels good. Summer best ball is here. Uh, make sure you hop in discord. Like Kyle said, the rankings are on the site. I'll have a new article out for you guys later on today. Check that out. But we are back next Friday for even more Best Ball Talk. We'll see you then. Have a good week. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. Don't forget to visit us on the web at thefantasyfootballers.com.